Hi everyone. Um, I was just saying to Rana that quite possibly I'm the only Scottish person at the show. Uh, so hopefully uh, my accent will not trouble you too much. I know there is a great interpreter um, and what I'm here to do today is talk a little bit more about the European trends within natural and organic beauty. So this is actually um, some information from Mintel. So they're reporting outstanding growth within the natural and organic beauty market. And they see that trend to continue for the next few years. And I find that really interesting. It means that natural and organic beauty products are more popular than ever. Going around the show this morning, I also noticed that there was lots of information about natural, organic and sustainable ingredients. And really, I think although the European trends will verify that, I actually do think it is a huge global trend. So what am I going to cover today? Well, in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to put it into three sections. I'm going to talk about healthiness and wellness within the European uh, market. I'm going to talk about consumer awareness of sustainability and what that actually means to Europeans. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm going to take maybe five to 10 minutes just to talk about what I've done myself with my organization and a skincare range that we have launched very recently into the European market, which will hopefully give you the sort of verification of everything that has gone before. As Rana said earlier, this presentation is available online. I am lucky, lucky enough or unlucky enough to be filmed I'm trying not to get nervous. You seem like a really nice crowd, so um, if I need your help, you can smile at me. Um, so let's get started with the first section. The first section here is talking about the convergence of health with beauty. And I think really, as an everyday consumer, this is something that's quite easy to understand. But I know that there will be lots of either chemists, scientists and brands in the room and you will want some more in-depth detail. The other thing I'd like to point out about this presentation is that if you actually need any of the references of where I've actually got this information to, or from rather, my email address is on the presentation. Please email me and I can send you the references. I just didn't want to bore you with that detail here today. So, what do we mean by health and beauty? Well, let me just move down. Sorry. Ah, there we go. So, European consumers are becoming more aware of the importance of healthy lifestyles. They're taking more responsibility for their personal health and they're integrating this into their everyday lives. In addition to understanding what it means to be healthy, it is changing amongst Europeans. It's not being healthy is not just being not ill. It's actually instead it involves a, light, a living, a healthy lifestyle, feeling fit, but looking radiant. And this is where beauty ingredients and products come in. This trend has led to an in increasing interest in cosmetic products with claims relating to well-being. So for example, relaxing or uplifting. This offers opportunities for exporters to manufacture and are able to prove such well-being claims with regards to their products. So the healthy living trend is also reinforcing the popular view that natural products are safer than synthetic products are. And amongst European consumers, this trend has sparked interest in natural cosmetics, products and beauty products. So the health trend is very related to aromatherapy and other natural remedies for healthier lifestyles. And it offers opportunities for exporters of essential oils and aromatherapeutic benefits. Cosmetic brands using essential oils with aromatherapy benefits in product innovations. 
And because of these properties, if you add these to your natural cosmetic products, then you can then correspond to that healthy living trend. So examples include things like aromatherapy body creams, bath salts, lipsticks, bath salts, anything that you can put essential oils into. Many of these oils are very, very popular with the European consumers. And to highlight just a few, lavender, lemongrass and peppermint. Not only are these great essential oils to use, they're actually very effective, but also from a cost perspective, they're very, very good to put into your products. So leading on to the healthier lifestyle, why this? I don't know why this isn't coming up. Sorry. So I don't know why that isn't coming up on there. So the next slide, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to actually talk about vitamins and minerals and where these play, play a big part in a healthy lifestyle. So we all know that having uh, the best vitamins and minerals, thank you, uh, within your lifestyle um, and taking these supplements give you a balanced uh, diet but also support a healthy lifestyle and this jump over into beauty makes sense because we always know that you are what you eat and your skin eats the beauty ingredients and eats the beauty products so why would we not use these more in our beauty products so if we come back to European consumers they're becoming more um, aware of the importance of healthy lifestyles. And this um, trend here just demonstrates the cross population. So in terms of people looking for healthy, proactive lifestyles, that is definitely on the increase. And people that are the eat, drink and be merries uh, is on the decrease. And we will see this continue for the next, uh, I would say at least five to 10 years. Let's see if I can make the next one move. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Ah, right, okay, thank you. <laughs> it's lucky that I make beauty products and I'm not responsible for Microsoft. Anyway, <laughs> okay, so, oh, I've missed a slide. I wanted to talk a little bit more about aromatherapy, yeah? And as we know, how does aromatherapy work? Well, it's fairly straightforward in terms of you either absorb it through your skin or you inhale it through your nose. And the great thing about aromatherapy is that there is the scientific research to back up why it actually works. The other great thing about it is that it is effective within beauty products and it's effective by being a natural beauty ingredient. The graph that we actually have here on the right hand side, this is actually demonstrating the growth in essential oil sales um, that's quite considerable up to the year 2020. And I think that this will continue to grow. So how can ingredients make consumers feel good and stay healthy? Well, one of the things that we know is aroma gives that benefit. So anything that you smell, if it smells nice to you, it makes you feel better. And inwardly, it is doing something within your bloodstream. So aromatherapy is very big for European consumers. And this is something to think about when you're adding it to um, your beauty products. So do you have ingredients that have properties or components that people can look at that either prevent illness or um, give them a healthier lifestyle? You want to try it? <laughs> or if it doesn't work, you just click this one. Right, brilliant, thank you. Okay, so we've talked about aromatherapy. 
Um, the next thing that I'd like to talk about is superfoods and the trend in superfoods, not just within the food industry, but definitely within the beauty industry and in Europe in particular. In Europe, the lines between cosmetic and food ingredients are becoming increasingly blurred. Cosmetic brands are making um, increasing use of natural food ingredients in their formulations because consumers associate such ingredients with health benefits and consider them safe for consumption. So cosmetics brands that can easily market them as elements of cosmetic products that are designed as a healthy lifestyle. So superfoods, for example, spirulina or other microalgaes, are a popular group, group of food products that are currently being used in cosmetics. Examples also include things like vegetable oils, um, anything that has a rich nutritional composition and possible health benefits. So if you're looking at um, vegetable oils, ensuring that they have high omega-3 or omega-7 fatty acids and any botanicals that are high in vitamins or proteins. So the convergence of food and cosmetic ingredients is also evident in Nutra Cosmetics, which are food products that claim to improve the appearance of consumers. If you're planning to supply ingredients for this segment, you will also be expected to meet the requirements of food and food supplements. In the near future, the global market for Nutra Cosmetics is expected to grow substantially. And this is really what uh, this graph here is demonstrating. So we're looking at an estimated sales currently of about 3.4 billion. And by 2020, that will have risen to 7.5 billion. So it's definitely an area that is growing, not just within Europe, but worldwide. European consumers are increasingly looking for Nutra Cosmetics that are free from artificial ingredients and that are, have interesting flavours. And the final products could include either powders or supplements, but also the ready-to-drink beauty market is set to grow substantially over the next few years. Aha! <laughs> The first section is now closed, I'm moving on to the second section, but just to recap, in terms of the first section, there is a big, big drive between what is happening within the food industry, how that relates to a healthy lifestyle, and how that then relates to the beauty products or the beauty ingredients that you're putting on your skin. Uh, and for me, the highlights are definitely aromatherapy and any sort of superfoods that can be added to your beauty products. Hopefully, when I get to the end of the presentation, you will see how I've tried to bring that together. Okay, so the next section is how do people actually make those healthy choices? Um, European consumers in particular have increased knowledge about organic, natural, and in particular, the word at the moment is sustainable. And when we talk about sustainable in Europe, it's not just about the actual ingredient, it's actually looking at everything that happens to produce that ingredient. Let me just make sure I've covered all my notes, yeah. 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 Go back to there. And then click. There you go. Thank you. So what I've done with this slide is that I've actually um, demonstrated the consumer market within Europe in four clear areas. And if I actually take number four and three first, these are the guys that are already buying natural products. In fact, you've got people that are very into DIY beauty. They're looking to make the, the uh, beauty products themselves at home because they can really understand where the ingredients have actually come from, from a traceability perspective. These guys are already engaged with natural, organic, and they still play a relatively small niche part of the market. Number two, the beauty junkie, and number one, if we take the beauty junkie first, this is the influencer, this is the person that reads the magazines, reads the blogs, is interested in PR. They may be a blogger themselves, they're the person that actually tells their friends and family and wider network which beauty products to actually buy. The beauty junkie is interested in effective beauty products. It doesn't matter whether they're natural and organic or whether they're synthetic. The first question 
question that they want to ask themselves is does the ingredient or the beauty product actually work? And that's what always is the first thing. It's not about price, it's not about how natural it is, it's about how effective it is, and all of the other things are taken into consideration after that. These guys are the ones that influence the rest of the market. But the bigger prize really is 70% of the population. And this is what I've called the never natural enhancer. This is your everyday consumer who maybe has a few beauty products in their bathroom cabinet. You know, they're not really in the know when it comes to beauty. They do wear makeup, but they probably only wear it when they're going out um, or maybe to work. They don't wear it all of the time. They maybe have a small selection of fragrances and perfumes that may have been bought in as gifts. Now, with natural products, they may be bought for gifts for this particular consumer. However, this consumer is starting to become more knowledgeable, and the reason for that is the healthy lifestyle. So they are starting to consider what ingredients are in their food. So they will eventually start to consider what ingredients are actually in their beauty products. And this is where there's a big opportunity for um, anyone that's making beauty products to target this consumer. I don't know if anyone has seen the recent L'Oreal um, advert with regards to how natural one of their cleansers actually are. And they're showing and demonstrating that one of the, the cleanser that they are advertising is 96% natural and the other 4% is only synthetic. If L'Oreal are already starting to advertise these sorts of products with a certain percentage of naturalness, then they are targeting this consumer because it's affordable, they're saying that the products work, and hey, what guys, it's 96% natural, so at least it's better than less than that. So I think that's really interesting that that has just happened over the past couple of months. And I do think that it will just continue to grow and more consumers in this area will definitely be more interested in the natural ingredients and where they come from. So this is one of the slides that I was getting quite excited about. Um, for me, this is what sustainable is all about. And this is where the European consumer is starting to think wider on sustainability. So at first they were thinking, okay, what ingredients, and are the ingredients natural? Are they organic? Are they sustainable? But then what has happened is, is that that has then grown out to what packaging is actually being used. Is that packaging recyclable? If it isn't, why not? They are asking questions about every area of your supply chain, not just your ingredients. And this is where the cradle to cradle model comes into play. Now at the moment, it's still quite niche. However, the trend is there, and that's why we are here today. We're here to discover the trends of what's going to happen between the next one, three, and five years. And the European consumer is becoming more and more engaged with this cradle-to-cradle -cradle model. What I've also done with the presentation, guys, is I have put some tips at the bottom just to give you some ideas um, that's on the presentation, but I'm not going to go through them today. Okay, so let's talk about sustainability in a little bit more detail, yeah? So corporate social responsibility or commercial social responsibility as I like to call it, is not just a tick box anymore. It is actually about how you run your overall business. So actually looking at CSR policies is not just enough. What consumers are looking for is they want to get into the granular detail of how do you run your business? Do you run it ethically? Do you run it sustainably? Yeah, and what is it that you're actually giving back? One of the things that ha has been a trend in the US and also in Europe is the B Corp certification. I'm not sure um, if anyone here has heard of this. If you do need any more information, then please drop me an email. But just to give you an overview, what this certification is about, it's fair trade for business. Yeah, so everybody knows what fair trade is, but that's only looking at one particular part of your supply chain. What B Corp is actually doing is it's asking each business to look at three different areas when they run their business. First, is it commercial? 
Yeah, because at the end of the day, that's why you're in business. You're in business to have a commercial orientation to your business. But they also look at two really other important pillars. The next is looking at community. And what that means is any, any touch point with a human being. So whether that's the people that work for your organization, the suppliers you come into contact with, the farmers that farm the ingredients, whatever that may be, it's the human element. And are you looking after that element ethically? And then the third part is the environment, which is really everything else. So animal welfare, the planet, how sustainable do you actually grow your ingredients? And to get the B Corp certification, you have to score quite highly. If you've gone through any sort of certification before, whether that's organic or natural or other fair trade, yeah, I've been through all of the certifications and we are B Corp certified as a business and it definitely wasn't the hardest certification that I've gone through. So just to give you some um, idea, because you can, can think that certification is very costly and also very time consuming. Yeah, with this one, it's not that it doesn't cost you, it does cost you, but it's very minimal in comparison to what you actually get back for it. For me, this is the next stage of corporate social responsibility. It's where you can actually stand up and talk about your business in a very sustainable manner because you're looking at all areas of your supply chain and how you run your business. So, the sustainable ingredient sourcing dilemma. Yeah, this is something that as a business I go through almost every single day, yeah? And it's about thinking about sustainable at, at a granular level. So, you know, in terms of naturally certified from the UK versus organic certified from Brazil, which one is the right one for our business? Yeah, so it's something that I think about, yeah, because I want to be the gatekeeper for the consumers so that they don't have to worry about that. However, this is a big question. So in terms of sustainability, which one is more sustainable? I'm not going to answer the question for you. I thought I would just leave that and hopefully get the grey cells moving. Um, the next example here is organic certified from Brazil versus locally organically farmed but not certified. Which one is the right one? Yeah, and these are the sorts of questions that I ask myself as a business um, and manufacturer of beauty products every day because I think this is the questions that consumers ask as well. And they may not be asking it now, but they will be asking it soon. And one of the big ones um, for me is argan oil versus Abyssinian oil. So argan oil comes from a very small part of the planet. In fact, it's not even just a country. It's a certain part of one very small country in the world. Everyone uses argan oil. Okay, maybe not everyone, but almost. Yeah? How sustainable is that to always have that only one ingredient in lots of different products? Yeah? Where, when we look at something like Abyssinian oil, it can actually be grown pretty much anywhere, not in Scotland, it's too cold. However, although it's originally from Ethiopia, it can be grown in Italy, Corsica, it can be grown almost anywhere that has, you know, Mediterranean temperatures. It's a very easy crop to grow, it has a high yield, yet it's actually very good from a diversity perspective because it increases the um, diversity of the flying insects that surround other fields. There's a whole raft of great reasons why we should use this and it works. So in any of the sort of tests, if we look at moisturization or hydration, it either delivers just as good results or better results than argan or jojoba oil. And yet, not many people are using it. But these are the sorts of questions that I do feel that consumers, in particular European consumers, are starting to ask. So it's not as easy as it looks. This is the other one, yeah. So if we look at this slide, if I just go down, this is the old palm oil debate. Now, if we look at this graph, the reason why we use palm oil so much is that it is brilliant. Yeah, it gives a high yield. 
in comparison to other oils, you know, it just does a great job. However, again, it can only come from certain areas, yeah? And if we are all using the same things at the same time, it doesn't really bode well for it being a sustainable ingredient. And I do think that we have, uh, we have decisions to make um, as manufacturers, um, as everyday human beings on the planet, to decide what type of ingredients that we should use. And there is so many out there that variety is definitely the spice of life. So why we don't use lots of different oils and think about not only yield, but think about the impact on the planet, the impact on the farmers, the impact on a particular country or area of the planet, and think about everything in a more holistic viewpoint rather than this is the best yield, so this is the one that we should use. So the natural trend has led to an increase in green and sustainable technologies in Europe. European companies are moving towards environmental responsibility throughout their chains, including the, with regard to logistics and processing facilities. Some examples of sustainable or clean production include, you know, production with lower CO2 emissions, uh, use or reuse of water, limited use of water, uh, using solar energy, treatment of wastewater. The list can be quite endless, but it's around making sure that we are thinking about all of these things with regards to sustainability. The next slide that I'm going to go on to is certification. <laughs> um, and the reason why I'm smiling is that this is not easy either. Now, this isn't all the certifications that you can get for beauty products, but it's quite a lot. Yeah? I don't even understand half of these things, and I'm in the industry. How can we expect a consumer to understand what is going on here? The other thing with the multitude of certifications, and it's not that I don't agree with certification, I do, yeah, but I, this actually gives other companies that are not certified, yet yeah, a way to use marketing to pretend that they are certified, because there is no real consistent measure globally. Now, I do know that there is some certification bodies out there, Cosmos in particular, that are looking to try and globalize um, certification and bring it under the one umbrella, but it's still early days. And I do think that as cosmetic companies, you know, this is a watch out for. Certification is definitely a pillar of sustainability. However, it confuses the consumer. And if you confuse the consumer, they then think that there's greenwashing and they think that they don't actually believe what the certification actually stands for. So, International cosmetic companies are aiming to ensure that their products meet the requirements in a range of countries. This is becoming easier as legislation is increasingly globalised, but at the same time there's differences between countries that persist. So for example in China, some companies require animal testing, which is largely illegal for European companies and European producers who would like to export to growing markets, for instance in Asia and the US, must comply with different legal systems. Again, this causes confusion, it means that there's more cost, and it can be a difficult path to follow. Um, and I think, as a consumer manufacturer, or rather cosmetic manufacturer and brand owner, I would like some way to simplify it. Um, with regards to certification of our products, we are certified, but we don't actually put it onto our packaging because I'm not really happy with what message that maybe gives out to the customers that are buying my products. I know if they do scratch beneath the surface that I feel happy with what they will find, um, but I do think that this is a big question it is a trend for Europeans, so they are going to start asking more questions, which I think will actually push us to having something that is more globally recognised. So, I think that's enough about sustainability. As you can tell, it's a topic that's close to my heart. So please, if you do have any additional questions, please um, email me and hopefully I can answer them. So... The next section here, what I'm trying to do now is bring those trends 
with additional couple of trends together into the one place and hopefully demonstrate uh, how we've tried to m work our way through all of these trends to bring to market something that I'm quite excited about. So multifunctional proven efficacy with a strong story. Well, this is really what consumers are looking for. They're looking for ingredients that really work. But not only that, because we don't have a lot of time, they're looking for ingredients that do lots of different things. And if you can demonstrate that with any of your ingredients, then that is something that is really, really powerful to the consumer. Um, it's no longer enough simply to market your ingredient as natural. You must show that the ingredient works in order to um, interest the consumer. So cosmetics producers are taking different routes. Some feature the performance of natural ingredients more prominently in the marketing of their cosmetic products, especially botanical extracts. So instead of marketing the natural or origins of particular ingredients, they highlight these performance, which is the best way to go to get that story across to the consumer. Other cosmetic pr producers position themselves more according to the natural origins of the ingredients. So where did the ingredient come from and what's the interesting story behind that particular ingredient? So this is actually um, what Beauty Kitchen stands for. So we feel that we are for women who love beauty products. We are a beauty brand that offers 100% natural, 100% effective, everyday luxury products with a sprinkle of fun and a big dollop of transparency. My name is Jo Chidley and I'm a chemist with a background in sales, product development and design. And this is my creation. We hope to be and be able to push the market more for sustainable beauty as a whole. Um, and I feel that um, in my next couple of slides, I'll hopefully demonstrate that to you. Okay, microalgae. It is a pretty boring ingredient. Yeah, so when you talk about seaweeds or microalgaes to consumers, they just think it's old hat, I've seen it before, I'm not interested, yeah? However, as an actual ingredient, it is a fantastic ingredient, not just something for you to eat, but also as a beauty ingredient. The results that it actually gives are fantastic, so the efficacy is definitely there. And the other sustainable elements of it, in terms of how it's produced, the science that sits behind that is fantastic. 50% of the air that we breathe has been recycled by microalgae, yeah? When you actually, microalgae is produced and it absorbs CO2, yeah, it releases energy which can be sold back to be created into electricity. What's not to like about this ingredient? As soon as you mention microalgae, consumers are not interested. So what can you actually do that's different? So in order to stand out in the competitive cosmetics market, manufacturers re rely on product innovation. We all know that. Innovation is what pushes things forward. So new ingredients are an important part of product innovation. And the following, there's sort of two routes that you can take. So you could start with a sort of top-down innovation. So you start with a cosmetics manufacturer, for example, um, and they have developed an ingredient that is promoting anti-aging or an anti-aging claim and it could ask its suppliers to deliver ingredients that could be used to support such a claim. The manufacturer would then develop a product based on one or more of these ingredients and it would own all of the intellectual properties relating to the product. Yet, yeah, or the other option is that you start with the supply side which is a bottom-up innovation. Excuse me. Suppliers who are able to start innovation on their own and develop the intellectual property for themselves could realize much greater results. The risks are substantially more, but the development of new ingredients, as the development of new ingredients is obviously very expensive. But bottom-up innovation begins with the documenting of traditional use. So looking at 
maybe a pretty boring ingredient and finding a way of how can you develop that particular ingredient for either skin care or body care with particular claims. So we've actually used at Beauty Kitchen a microalgae um, and we've actually developed a skincare range which is called seahorse plankton. Yeah? Plankton is another name for microalgae. Seahorses eat plankton. One of the plankton microalgae that seahorses eat, yeah, is actually great for your skin. So although it is a microalgae, and that is, you know, with regards to its inky name, we have created something new by calling it seahorse plankton. Now seahorses are magical, mystical creatures. They're very tiny, but they live for 15 years. And one of the reasons is their diet. And that's where we've identified this particular microalgae as something that's great within skincare. The results that it actually gives is fantastic. The actual clinical trials that have been done on this particular ingredient um, have given some great results. Excuse me. If you have the active ingredient, which we have in our um, angel oil at 2%, you actually get results of increasing collagen synthesis by 19.3% in 24 hours. Yeah, and what we've done is we've taken this one active ingredient, we've added lots of other things, we've used essential oils, it's 100% natural in terms of a range, the preservative system that we're using is fairly straightforward. Um, and this is a range that we launched in the UK, not quite um, 12 months ago. Uh, it was named in Marie Claire as one of the top seven ingredients to look out for. And we've created this story behind this one pretty boring ingredient to begin with because we've called it something different and we've created that consumer awareness at a variety of different levels. So we've talked about superfoods, we've talked about fatty acids because that's what it contains is your omegas. Yeah, we've talked about the efficacy, so how it actually works and why it actually works. It is also sustainable. So in terms of the microalgae, we don't actually take it from the sea. So we we take nothing from there. We actually grow it in what I call a big greenhouse. It's a little bit more technical than that. But microalgae obviously only grows in the top 10% of the water. So we actually have it in a greenhouse. And when the microalgae is um, growing, it creates the energy which we sell back as electricity. So in terms of the impact that it actually has on the planet from a sustainability perspective, it is zero. Yeah, we've also raised the plight of seahorses. So we give 2% of our overall sales to the Seahorse Trust, which is a charity that's trying to raise awareness that 51 out of the 53 species of seahorses are actually endangered. And this is something that most people don't know. So again, what this does is we've taken one really basic ingredient that definitely works, it's affordable, but we've created a story that European consumers are looking for that fits in with natural, organic, sustainable, but it also fits in with the other trends. Is it a healthier lifestyle? Well, yes, it's 100% natural and it's given you this result in your skincare. Yeah, when we're talking about vitamins and minerals, superfoods, the sustainability aspect, everything is there for this particular range. So let me just check. So consumers are, I'm going to read my notes now rather than just what I've said. Consumers are becoming increasingly interested in the stories behind the cosmetic products they use. Ingredients can be an important component of such stories. And consumers are especially interested in ingredients of increasing provenance or origins. Some examples can include either fascinating locations, fascinating marine life, anything that uses traditional or specific local production processes and traditional uses or traditional beauty rituals. Okay, this is my last slide that's come up. This is just some of the marketing material that we've used for seahorse plankton. And what I was trying to do was just bring to life maybe some of those trends and how I've interpreted those trends and tried to put that into my um, products and into my marketing story. So what we've got here is we've got something that I hope you'll agree is inviting, it's likable, you know, it's something that 
even if you don't know what seahorse plankton is, you maybe lean in to think, I want to hear more. And as, I can, as someone that is obviously selling to consumers, that's what I'm looking for. But I also want to take into consideration the trends that we've talked about. And as you know, natural, organic and sustainable is very, very important to Beauty Kitchen and to me. Thank you.